Thank you, everybody who's joining in. This is a great opportunity um, to get to know more people. Jun Ran Kao is now a doctor. He got his PhD. No, not a real one. <laughs> he got his PhD recently in Western Australia, and he's done a fantastic job. He's collected the questions that have been submitted so far and tried to put them in some sort of order um, so that we can cover the subject um, in more a logical way than just going from one topic to another. Um, I must start by saying that many as Australia was so disappointing when it had to fold for lack of funding. And we were all very sad because a support group for many as disease is so important. Um, people don't want to think they're the only person that has horrible disease. And Anne Elias has done a stupendous job in setting it up in Sydney. And now it's spreading and we've got Monica Burns in Newcastle and it's fantastic. It's a great resource and she should certainly be congratulated. So I won't, uh, so well done, Anne. Well done, Monica. I'll pass over to Juan now because um, we only have an hour and we'd better see what we can get through as many questions as possible. Yeah, certainly. Thank you so much, mm. Professor Gibson. It's such a great treat for everyone in this webinar. And I just want to quickly say also thank you to Anne and Ling for organizing this. Mm. Um, Finally, thank you for everyone for your questions that you emailed to M prior to the webinar. Um, please be assured that all your questions have been collected and we've grouped them in certain categories, ranging from the causes all the way to um, research outlook. And please do continue to type your questions in the, in the chat window. I am monitoring them. And as we, um, you will see, some of them are already covered in the, in the questions here. Um, so, Professor Gibson, we will begin with the causes and mechanisms of Meniere's disease, MD. Um, the first question asks, was there anything that we did wrong to bring this illness on ourselves, perhaps due to diet, listening to loud sounds of music, or is there a genetic component? I think it's a question many of us have had. I don't think you can blame yourself for, for getting this disease. It, it isn't like that. It isn't something you did wrong in some previous life that come back to haunt you. Um, we do know there's a possible genetic component. The sixth chromosome, the short arm of the sixth human chromosome, um, has uh, been found to be deficient in about 10% of patients with many heirs. And this is an arm of, this is a chromosome that's important for producing the human leukocytic antibody. And this is one of our, uh, the things, a key defense uh, for um, fighting viruses and things like that. So this, um, there is a, about 10% of people do have a family history and there is a, an underlying genetic uh, problem with a small defect on one of the chromosomes. Um, that was researched by one of my previous, my old bosses at St. Mary's in Paddington, but now it's um, quite a lot of interest. So maybe one day if somebody has many heirs, their children could perhaps have a test soon to see whether they have the same deficiency and are more likely to get many heirs. If they're more likely to get many heirs, then they probably should be careful um, not to provoke it with, with aspects of their diet. But listening to loud sounds does not, um, is not related to many ears. People with noise induced hearing loss aren't more prone to get many ears disease. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you have answered the follow up questions to that, which is if it is in our DNA, should our children be yeah. well enough and would that show up in the genomic test? Not in everyone, some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. But, and the second question asks in your bio biography, it was mentioned that a successful vaccine for the herpes virus family may cure many mini years cases. Is this still um, in view? We think that um, in some cases of many, it's not, not all of them, the herpes virus could be um, one of the responsible factors. And they brought out a medication called Zostavax. And it's given and uh, it's to prevent you getting shingles. So if you had 
checking box when you were younger, you can have this up to the age of 75. After 75, they don't like giving it because it can cause a bit of a reaction in older patients. Uh, they have been looking at it. Um, and I think we have no evidence yet it, 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 how effective it is. But if I was uh, in, your, in that category and I have many years and I was under 75, I would, I would think I would go and get Zostavax because it is good for stopping the shingles, but it may be good for your many years as well. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. And I will just very quickly mention for the audience, um, there may be many terms that I mentioned in this webinar. If you didn't get them, that's okay. We will be uploading the recordings online and with a transcript to go along with it. And question three, Professor Gibson, is one that many people ask, which is, what are your thoughts on MD being an autoimmune condition? Have you seen any successful outcomes when it is treated as an autoimmune condition, particularly for patients who react well to oral but not intratopanic steroids? We, we have been looking to see if we can find a, an immune factor in many years. Um, heat shock protein 70 is the one that they're looking at, and you can, but it hasn't really succeeded. We know that if you're immunodeficient, you're more likely to get many airs, so that, that, that fits. And we also know that um, some people with many airs do respond well to steroids. There's a problem because you can't stay on steroids indefinitely because they have side effects. It's not good for you. Um, recently, we've been trying to avoid the oral steroids because of the side effects and looking more at intratympanic administration of the steroids. So if you look at ENT surgeon, you, surgeons that treat many as, I think probably about um, a third of them would be thinking that there is an autoimmune condition that we're trying to treat results in many as. So it's quite a popular um, theory. Thank you. Question four is about the mechanism of MD. In an article you published in 2010 titled Hypothetical Mechanism for Vertigo in Minious Disease, you reviewed the evidence for the drainage hypothesis. And the two questions surrounding that are, does this remain the dominant theory today in explaining MD's mechanism? And are you optimistic that this hypothesis will be proven in the near future? I'm getting optimistic. Um, the uh dominant theory at the moment is still membrane rupture in the ear, that the high drops causes the inner ear membrane to rupture and then poisons the vestibular system, causing the attack of vertigo. Um, Daniel Brown, um, who used to work in our laboratory, um, he's done some good work on that. And really it's not whole, and Ian Curtois. idea that um, something else is causing the attacks is quite prevalent. My own theory was that it was um, an excess of fluid in the cochlear portion, which suddenly regurgitated into the vestibular system, causing the attacks. There's quite a lot of work going on, and I'm feeling quite confident that uh, if it's not exactly the theory I propose, but something similar will, will soon be found. If we know the, the cause of the attacks, that would be a great help to, to knowing what the possible causes of the disease are. Indeed, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah take a confirmation there. Thank you, Professor. And now we're moving on to the second category, which is to do with symptoms of MD. And this question asks, can one have all the symptoms of minius but not actually have Minious disease. Yeah. So we're looking at a hearing loss, attacks of vertigo, which last for more than 10 minutes, tinnitus in the affected ear, and a feeling of fullness in the ear. So there's four symptoms. You can get um, these symptoms from other causes, of course. You could have a combination, you could have a, a blockage of your eustachian tube together with a hearing loss be suffering from attacks of vertigo due to another cause such as migraine. But the thing that connects many is, is if the time when you get the attacks is actually associated with a change in the 
affected ear. So if you find that when you have the, first of all, the attacks of vertigo should last for more than 10 minutes and be rotational, um, not just um, a constant feeling of dizziness. Um, when you get one of those attacks, if you actually notice that the hearing has changed or become distorted in the affected ear, if you feel that the tinnitus got louder, or if the fullness increased. And if you can bond all the symptoms together, then the chances that you don't have Benny is extremely slight. So we can diagnose Benny as clinically. And I used to have a 10 point um, thing. So if you had um, 10 points of many years, uh, uh, it was certain. If you had more than seven, so you might miss out on one of the symptoms, but you could still have, um, have um, many years disease. So the Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And indeed, that 10 point system, I think for anyone to Google on um, Gibson 10 point system, Meniere's disease, you will see the whole category on, on, yeah. in one of the articles. Um, and you have, in fact, answered the following question, but I'll just read out for completeness. Um, this question asks I have been told that only the rotational attacks are Meniere's and that general dizziness is something else. Is this correct? Yes, you're correct. You, in many areas, it's very characteristic of vertigo because you actually feel you or the room is turning around and that can go um, for hours. Um, if the attacks last more than 10 minutes, we think that's significant. But a lot of people, especially with the first attacks, the attacks can come on um, uh, and last several hours. Seems horrible. Joanne knows about this. <laughs> <laughs> does go on for a while, those very good attacks. Mm. And question seven is quite a general question about the diagnosis of MD. And it simply asks, what's the best way to get diagnosed for many years? Um, to see, you see an ENT surgeon or a neurologist that has an interest in many years disease, and they can ask, exclude other conditions that aren't many years. So that's the advantage of seeing a doctor rather than say an audiologist. Um, first of all, we can make the diagnosis on the history because it's so characteristic, but then there's a whole lot of tests that we can show um, to back up the diagnosis. First of all, the audiogram. The audiogram can be quite characteristic. It, it's, um, tends to go down more in the low frequencies than the high frequencies, and it can fluctuate. And that's a, a real sign of many years. The um, uh, other tests that are done, in particular, one I, the, are the vestibular tests. And some of these tests are getting quite characteristic. When they do the caloric test, which is the one with the water in the air, which people don't like very much, that often shows the loss of balance in the ear, whereas the um, newer tests of the head thrust and vent may not be positive to begin with. So this is some a differential of vestibular tests, which are very characteristic, and um, we're still working on to know exactly why this happens. Finally, the tinnitus um, can usually be low frequency, so it, but it can be a real nuisance to people. So I also do a test called electrocochleography, which just shows any distortion in the inner ear. And uh, if it shows that distortion, then that's another thing that would strongly suggest that many ears disease is present. So we haven't, I haven't done any uh, DNA tests. Uh, that'll be, <laughs> that's for the future. That's already quite comprehensive to mm. diagnosis. Thank you, Professor Gibson. And thanks for everyone who's been putting questions in the chat yeah. window. I am monitoring them. Um, some of the questions you're asking are going to be featured presently. Um, in fact, we're, we're onto the category, which is a rather large one about triggers of MD. And the first question is, what is the role of stress in mini S disease? Stress is definitely related to many S disease. We've, there's various me mechanisms that we can think of. Um, in, when somebody gets stressed, they do tend to retain fluid in their body. If you're an animal and you think you're being chased by a lion or whatever, 
the last thing you want to do is to stop and have a drink and a pee. So you, you have a hormone called vasopressin. And when this is released, it causes uh, fluid to build up in the whole body. And if fluid builds up in the body, you're more likely to cause the attacks of many years. So there's no doubt that stress is a, a major factor in causing many years disease. Yes, thank you. And another potential factor, this question I would like to ask, does atmospheric pressure change? Sorry, does changes in atmospheric pressures affect or trigger MD? Yes, uh, and that has been found to be helpful. The um, people with many years disease sometimes can sense a change in atmospheric pressure because it impacts on their fluid pressure within the ear and the fullness in the ear changes. Um, there's a chap called Professor Salt in Washington um, who has found that if you go under these windmills, electrical um, things, if they generate uh, less than 50 hertz, a very low frequency sound. And he's convinced that if people with many ears go under the um, the generators, uh, they can actually produce attacks. Mm -hmm. So changes in pressure affecting your ear can induce an attack. Oh, wow, that, that is fascinating. And one to remember, Uncle. Yes. Uncle days. <laughs> yes. And the next question is about a, any, is there any evidence to show a correlation between osteoporosis and MD? If so, does that mean calcium or a lack of calcium can come into play as a trigger? Um, uh, no, there hasn't been any um, study to show any evidence that osteoporosis and many as disease are related. Calcium is quite an important uh, elect electrolyte um, and within the ear, helping to um, change the potentials within the hair cells. So calcium does have a role in the ear, but having a low blood calcium or uh, does not affect many S disease. Okay. And question 11 and 12 are re somewhat related. For question 11 is says, is there any link between perimenopause and heightened MD symptoms? Yes, definitely. Yes, because prior to um, a period, a lot of women do put on fluid and they can actually tell that you can either weigh yourself, you just go up a very slight amount, or you can feel the fluid in the ankles. And um, so what happens is about three days before the period, you're putting on a lot of fluid in the body that affects the ear, and that's the time they can get um, attacks. So if you're a female and this happens, it is quite good because if we give you a diuretic at that time, that can often avert the problem, get rid of the fluid from the body, and they don't have to take the diuretic except for the four or five days before a period and a couple of days afterwards. They don't have to take the diuretic the whole time. So it's very good. And for people where that does make a difference, it can certainly help. Fantastic, thank you. And the next question is quite lengthy. It touches on the same theme, and I just wanted to read up for completeness. Um, she asks, for female patients, is there any association between the likelihood of a vertigo attack and hormonal changes at different times of the month during pregnancy and or miscarriage? And the questioner um, provides a bit more detail in that many of their attacks have been on the first or second day of period. Yeah. Other attacks will occur during pregnancy or one or two days before a miscarriage. And finally, um, it's asked, could birth, birth control help at all? I think you've, you've covered most of the- Yes, of, uh, but there's a definite, um, uh, pregnancy can affect many S disease, definitely. Whether it's hormonal or just fluid retention, I'm not sure. Um, so there are people who um, become pregnant and then their, their many S does get a whole lot worse. And they have, um, they can't take all the medications we'd like them to take, so it, it's pretty rough on them. But once the baby is born, um, often the many S does get better, so that's nice. Um, birth control, yes, I mean, if you don't get pregnant, uh, you wouldn't get this, this factor. But this obviously affects some ladies and 
Um, I've had patients where during their pregnancy, they've had a terrible time with their Meniere's disease. Thank you, Professor. For the next question, um, I will jump to one in the chat window because I think it is quite relevant right now. Um, so this was the first question that we had there. I would like to know Professor Gibson's advice on drinking fluids and if he recommends limiting these. I've been told by my ENT to limit my fluid to 750 milligrams a day. So I read that drinking more is better. Um, and this questioner has developed low blood pressure since since beginning this diet of low fluid, no caffeine, and very low salt, and wonder if this can be connected. No, um, the, the, with plain water, the Japanese, very interestingly, uh, are giving a, about two and a half liters of water, making their many as people drink 70 mils of water per kilogram body weight. That's about two and a half um, liters. Poor souls, they have to be near the bathroom, I guess. But, uh, but the sense, it is sensible because when you drink that much fluid, you will get rid of a lot of salt from the body. There's no question about that. So um, drinking fluid should be encouraged. Um, that's water, not beer or wine, I'm sorry to say, but water is, is, is very good. So you shouldn't be restricting water. Definitely not. Mm. And it might be for some people that can't tolerate diuretics and things, um, it might, because of their blood pressure, um, drinking a lot of water may be one of the solutions and keeping on a low salt diet, of course. Right, thank you. Yes, so drinking water, the restriction on water there, yes. No, just, don't restrict it. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and we're making great time, so I think all the questions that will be answered. Yeah, um, in answer some of the ones that have come in, yeah. Yes. And now we're on to the progression of mini S disease. The first question I would like to know, is burnout a reality? And if so, can you describe that stage? And how will we know when we have arrived at that stage? So burnt out is a reality. It's the end stage of mini S disease. Um, so sadly, at this stage, the hearing will be poor in the affected ear. Um, the attacks of vertigo peter out are very small, um, um, and nothing like they were when they first had it. Unfortunately, the tinnitus may persist, and the sense of fullness in the ear can be persisting. Um, not in ev everybody, but in a lot of people, when it burns out, um, um, it's not a nice end to this. We don't like the fact that it burns out in people. That means the whole disease has wrecked the ear and really we haven't done anything very clever to stop it doing it. So the way you tell is when the, atta the attacks of vertigo start to diminish or even cease. So they're getting less intense. If you just go into a remission and then you get another attack, often in the attacks, pretty awful when you get another cluster of attacks. But when the disease burns out, the actual vertigo attacks diminish in intensity. The hearing loss is pretty awful, 60 dB plus. Um, so the ear, very hard to hear, even with a hearing aid. And we are looking at cochlear implants in these ears, which have such poor residual hearing. I have patients though that are having such a bad time with their vertigo. They say, when can I, how, when is it going to burn out? When can we, um, when, when will, can we expect the vertigo to stop? Um, we can't be precise. I have patients where the whole disease is over within three, four, five years. I have others where 20 years later, they're still getting intermittent episodes. It varies. And indeed, the follow-up question to that, Professor Gibson, is that are there any surgical procedures that can help us arrive at the burnout stage more quickly? Yeah, well, we, that's what we used to do, was to destroy part of the ear, because the disease is destroying the hearing and the balance in the ear. That's the reason it diminishes, because the balance gets less and less in the ear. So we used to do a thing called labyrinthectomy, where we actually did destroy the ear, 
it took away the hearing as well. So people did think that was a good idea. Then they did what we call a nerve section. And the idea of the nerve section was you only cut the balance nerve and not the hearing nerve. Um, but both of those mean that you completely and utterly lost all the balance in the affected ear. And people do get nervous in case the other ear should ever get involved. Now that they're having to uh, manage only with the balance only on one side. Um, nowadays, we would prefer gentamicin because although it does weaken the ear, you don't have to completely destroy all the balance in the ear to get a good result. So gentamicin is taken over for most of the surgeries. And indeed, gentamicin will, will come on very, very shortly. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I can just pause for five seconds and ask everyone to put their microphone on mute, um, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, Ling, if you wouldn't mind, perhaps, yeah, just muting um, a number of listeners. Um, so, so this is a final question associated with the burnout stage, is that once we're at the burnout stage, are we able to go back to our normal diets? Well, theoretically, um, once, um, once the ears burnt out, you can't damage it anymore. It's already damaged. Um, so you might be tempted to go back and enjoy your uh, normal diet. People that have been on a salt-free diet for a while actually don't like salt anymore in their diet, so they get used to not having it, and it's good for their blood pressure and other things. Um, but the fear that everybody has, I think, is should it that they don't want it to affect their other ear. Mm -hmm. So being on a on a salt-free diet and being careful and not drinking too much coffee and all that sort of thing, I think is sensible. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, thank you. And this question has, um, is quite lengthy and I will just quickly read through that. Um, it says, I'm not 53 years old and I've had many years since I was 12. I think I'm not in the late stages and don't often get vertigo, but my hearing still fluctuates a great deal and seems to be on a slow and steady decline. I'm interested to know if the hearing loss will bottom out as it were and how would I tell when it has? Um, you mentioned earlier, Professor, that it is 60 plus dB in the in the Yeah, it gets worse and worse, but you've also got other factors that can affect the hearing. If there's a, a family hearing loss, you know, people in the family lose their hearing when they're older, that could add in, or if you've done, taken things that could have affected your hearing, that might add to the, the many years loss. The fact that it still fluctuates is fantastic. And what... Um, we found because Celine McNeil and I worked together for a long time and she did her PhD on fitting hearing aids to people with many ears. And what we found yeah. was that you really do have to have a hearing aid that you can adjust yourself. You can't just set the hearing aid at one level. You have to be able to increase it when it goes down yeah. um, and put it up when it's yeah. better. Okay. Wait, hang on. I think someone may have missed the, um, the mute button at the left corner. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, we'll continue on, um, Professor Gibson. So the next one is about a drop attack. Can you explain what a drop attack is? And associated with that, how likely is someone with MD to have drop attacks? Mm -hmm. And would this occur during the early or the later stages of the disease? Uh Drop attacks are uh, due to otolith crisis. So that's a crisis of the utricular system in the ear. And that only occurs very late in the disease. So usually after it has, the, t the ordinary attacks have stopped, have diminished. So they're in this third or final burnt out stage. When they have a drop attack, suddenly, according to my theory anyway, the fluid that moves around in the ear can affect the utricle. And then without loss of consciousness, they lose all the power in their legs and they subside to the ground. This is extremely dangerous for some people because they can damp break bones. It's also a catastrophe if you're a driver because you know, we have to tell you not to drive a motor vehicle if you're suffering drop attacks. The only good news about drop attacks is that they usually peter out after two or three years. 
Um, it, what we can do if at this stage, if if the people don't want to wait and worry about having these drop attacks, uh, give gentamicin to try and weaken the ear so the drop attacks are not so severe. The differential diagnosis of, di of drop attacks is cardiac. And if you have a cardiac problem, you can also get drop attacks. So it's very important that we don't just assume it's due to the many ears, but also you should have a cardiac check as well. Fortunately, only about 10% of people with many ears disease end up having drop attacks, but they are horrible when it happens. Indeed, thank you. Mm. The next question asks, what are the chances, and many people have asked this, that, um, what are the chances of developing bio, bilateral MD, and is there anything we can do to prevent it from happening in both ears? Yes, um, it's, it is a fear that the other ear will get involved. About 30% of people who have many ears disease in one ear do develop bilateral disease. This can be um, years after the onset of the first year. Um, you, interesting enough, I find that when they do get bilateral disease, uh, usually it isn't quite as bad as when they had the first one. So that's what can you do to prevent it? Well, there's not a lot we can do. Uh, we would tell you not to do the aggravating things like salt loading and, and taking um, too many coffees and things like that during the day. Um, try to uh, try not, not to get stressed very hard. Um, but it, all these things, and I guess you just have to uh, pray that it doesn't happen to you. And I think the same question I asked, I, I will read out the question there. Um, what can you suggest for those who have severe chronic bilateral imbalance after MD for 30 years and two CIs? I'm not too sure what CI stands for there. Well, um, if, you, if you lose the balance in one ear, then you have to cope with the balance that you've got left in the other ear. If you have bilateral disease, even worse, if you've lost balance in both your ears, um, the other ways of maintaining your balance are your joints or proprioceptors. So we feel our legs and knees and back tells us where we are. And our eyes, our eyes in human beings are the dominant source of your balance. So if you go through a car wash, you think you're going backwards when the car goes through the car wash. Um, so if you've lost balance in both your ears, then you're trying to cope with poor ear balance. And what we try to do usually is to en enhance your proprioceptor. So there are vestibular physiotherapists and you have to stay with it. And they try to make you more dependent on the joint sense, the balance you get from your joints rather than your ears. And you can certainly use your eyes, but we don't like you to get too dependent on your eyes because when it's darkness, um, yeah, you would lose those. You might tumble. Indeed. Mm. Thank you. And we're, we're also making great time to get through these uh, mountains of questions as well as okay. the new ones coming through. And now we're at the category of treatments for mini ears disease. The first question here asks, do grommets help with mini ears? Uh, there was a guy called Montandenon in France and also Chumakin himself. We're very keen on grommets. And there are some people where just stopping any fluctuation of pressure in the middle ear does help. The only problem that I've had is that keeping a grommet permanently in your ear usually meant, it means that you end up with a perforation in the ear when the grommet comes out. And, and you can be very prone to having infections in the ear, especially if you get in, you careful, not careful in the shower or whatever. Um, the bugs get down in the ear and you get ear infections. Um, I was quite keen on grommets at one stage. I've gone off them a bit because of the long-term uh, consequences. Thank you. The next question is a very popular question um, and it is all about gentamicin. Yeah. So uh, many people have posed the question, is gentamicin recommended? And can you explain a bit more about what it does and the procedure? Gentamicin is a way of weakening the balance in the affected ear. 
so that it, that ear cannot produce such strong vertigo. Now, in the old days, they used to destroy the ear completely, but the big advantage of gentamicin is that we only have to weaken it. We don't have to get rid of all the balance in the ear. There's quite a, um, a lot of evidence coming in, especially from the States, that one intratympanic injection of gentamicin can be sufficient to drastically reduce the attacks of vertigo with, that, with very little loss of overall balance. So it's, it's a very favoured uh, thing nowadays. People are, people are wary because they know that it um, does get rid of some of their balance. So it has to be done carefully. They're worried about hearing loss, but you have to, with the smaller doses of gentamicin, it's very rare to get any um, hearing loss. Thank you. And this is just a sample point of one book. In my own case, I have benefited enormously from one shot of one injection yeah. of gentamicin. Um, the next question, Professor Gibson, is quite lengthy, so I will spend a little time reading that out. You ask, can you talk about endolymphatic sac decompression surgery as well as endolymphatic duct blockage surgery? Both of these require adding an ex external device inside the inner ear. The first a shunt to help with drainage and the latter a chip clipped to prevent fluid from building up. And the question I would like to ask, how effective are these surgeries? How common are they in Australia and what the success rates are? So, quite so a lot going on there. <laughs> that's all right. We see your question then, Joao. <laughs> yeah. um, um, yes, uh, endolymphatic sac surgery was first trialed in 1927 by George Portman. Um, the, the, the thought was that when you opened up the sac, it could drain fluid more easily. But we've had a bit of doubt whether you, if you start opening it, whether you're actually damaging it. We think the endolymphatic sac may be an important structure um, for immunologically. And so it's a little bit worried about uh, damaging it, but there is some work now in Canada, uh, what was his name, Saliba, um, where they block the duct. And what happens if you block the duct? And I myself actually used to remove the endolymphatic sac, similar to the, it cause, according to my results, you end up in the third stage of many air. So the hydrops increases in the air because you've blocked it. You end up losing a certain amount of hearing, but it does stop the attacks because you can't drain the ear precipitously anymore. I think it might come back a bit into vogue. Um, you put something about a... a we, we, we've got a man coming to work with us who could, does nano robotics, and it would be interesting to know if you could do something to get particles down into the sack and, uh, um, um, and enhance the characteristic. So the, I was quoting a success rate when I used to remove the sack of around 70% but you do lose a bit of hearing because we're burning out. We're, we're pushing the many as into the burnt out stage in one fell swoop. I did even have a few patients that did get drop attacks even after the sack was removed. So it wasn't very nice. Um, they're not so commonly, but they are being done in Australia. Yes, um, ENT surgeons do it, especially those that are interested in many as. And, the rationale is that it um, burns your many ears up so you don't suffer the attacks. Thank you. And for now, the final question in terms of treatment um, is the following. The question is, I had endolymphatic sac removal in 1994. I had two drop attacks in the following year yeah. and no dizziness attacks. I presume to mean vertigo attacks since. My hearing has deteriorated particularly in the last 10 years. Yeah. I have had continuous tinnitus in that year. Is the operation still being offered for severe cases? Well, that's exactly what I was talking about. Mm, yes. You can still get drop attacks after the sac has been removed because we put you to the end stage of the disease, but it does usually stop the dizziness, which is why people are 
the hearing is not good after sac surgery. It does go down with sac and can continue to um, deteriorate due to a number of factors. Uh, the tinnitus um, is not um, really affected by sac removal. The tinnitus, um, once you burn out, you have a chance of adapting to the tinnitus. You can get fed up with listening to it. You just put your mind on other things. Some people can do that. Some people find that incredibly difficult to do and are really bothered by their tinnitus. I see. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Professor. Um, the next series of questions are to do with a variety of different topics. Um, the first asks, can the vestibular membrane rupture without a fluid buildup in the endolymphatic chambers? I.e., can it tear on its own due to weakness or, or wear and tear over the years rather than due to fluid buildup? No, we don't. We're now going away from the theory that ruptures are the cause of the vertigo. I have my own theory, other people have other theories, but the rupture theory is beginning to look a bit unlikely. It, uh, it can't tear on its own due to weakness. It only tears if you get high drops or too much fluid in the ear. Um, strengthening the vestibular membrane, which is called Reisner's membrane. Um, we think now that we don't think it's a rupture, will not make any difference. Maybe it's possible to strengthen it in the future, but it may not make any difference to your Meniere's disease. Thank you. And the next one is a, a very common question about management of tinnitus and how do we manage it? And what happens to tinnitus and oral fullness over time? Yes, it's, it's a big question. It's not just just related to many instances. Um, tinnitus, we think, is due to a generator from your ear that goes to your hearing part of your brain. But on the way to your brain, it goes through structures that can amplify the tinnitus. So one of the big ones, the reticular system, part of your brain, which alerts you to sound. So if you're walking through a graveyard late at night, and you hear a twig break, whoa, you jump. <laughs> That's not because the sound's any louder, because your brain is enhancing it. Sadly, the brain can enhance tinnitus as well. So that's really um, sad for the people that have it. And the more they concentrate on the tinnitus um, or even think about it, the louder the tinnitus gets because of these amplifiers. So we are now looking at ways of trying to we don't like masking tinnitus, putting a very loud sound in the ear so you can't hear the tinnitus because when you stop that, the tinnitus is often worse than ever. But we are looking at strategies to compete with the tinnitus. So the hairs that are generating the tinnitus have another job to do rather than generate tinnitus. So that can be done either through a hearing aid or by various strategies using music. And that's quite popular. Um, they're claiming fairly good success rates, um, but tinnitus is um, an awful thing, not just for many as people, but lots of other people as well. Indeed, yes. Thank you. This question is about the COVID vaccine. Is it safe for people with MD to take? I'm pretty sure it is, but I, I, I don't know definitely. Um, I think I'd rather have, if it did anything, it would maybe just, it, I don't think it would be dangerous at all. And if you don't take the COVID vaccine, you could die. So you're better off <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to take it. Yes. Great, yes. Um, question, um, the following question is quite of a general nature. Um, she, he or she says, I'm constantly tired due to MD. How can we regain yeah, our yes. energy? Yeah, that's one of the symptoms. I think it's tiring having bad balance and poor hearing and everything else. Um, uh, the, the other one is brain fog that people talk about, that they find it hard to concentrate on things. So many as disease, that is one of the adjunctive symptoms, tiredness, brain fog, etc. I don't know the best way of, of um, 
regaining your energy. Where if we can do something to help the many airs, that would help. But um, if you can get a good night's sleep, if people don't sleep um, mm -hmm. or have sleep apnea or anything, then that really does impact on, on tiredness, especially in people with many airs. So you do need a decent night's sleep. Yes. And the following set of questions are to do with the SP1500 viral trial. Um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about that, Professor Gibson, and the question specifically asks if a link has been made between MD and viruses, particularly the Epstein-Barr virus. I'll, I'll do with the um, uh, SP1005 is been um, Jennifer Derbury, at the House Institute is running this trial, and it's a very powerful antioxidant. It's called glutathione perioxidase mimetic. And the people take 400 milligrams twice a day for 28 days, and they've been following these people for 84 days. Um, so it's really all done in Los Angeles at the moment. They, they say there's a 30% reduction in the many S attacks. So I'm not sure what, whether they mean in the severity or the number of attacks, but that's a bit whiffy because with placebos, you can sometimes get that kind of response. But interesting in what they are saying is that it can sometimes help hearing. So if your hearing is, is still not completely damaged, you might be able to revive some of those sick hair cells and improve the hearing. So we don't know the outcome of this trial. It's, as I said, it's done by in Los Angeles and we should, I think it completes, it's about, I've forgotten when it's going to complete, but maybe in, in, a, in a year or more. Great, thank you. And so antioxidants, maybe an idea for people with poor hearing. Yes, thank you. And in our recording upload, we can perhaps put a link there to the to the trial. And now we're on to the last um, segment before we we go to these questions yeah. from today, which is to do with um, possible cure and the future outlook of MD research. Um, so the first one asks: Are the latest researches on MD getting closer to newer treatments, drugs, etc.? And and we will just know that this year is the 160th year since the French physician Paul Minias first described yeah. this condition that now bears his name. Yeah, I've, I've visited Prosper Minias grave, had my photo taken. He really was fantastic because he focused, he, up to then they thought it was a brain disease and he said it, it is the year and he's correct. Um, we've got new treatments such as gentamicin, maybe uh, antioxidants, maybe this auto autonomy thing, which is a gel that's inject injected in the air that contains steroids, but we haven't got a cure yet. And we are at the many at Sydney University, we've um, employing a chap called Mohsen Asadnia, who's actually an engineer, and he's going to start in May as the many as lead researcher at the university. And we've got our team, and we've now got the money together to pay this guy. And uh, we're, we would love to be at the university at the forefront of finding the cure. I think there's several other people around the world that would love to do that as well. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. And in fact, this, this is the same question as the last one, which um, interesting also says if the scientific community can manage, it's not quite the same thing, but can manage to get a vaccine for COVID in less than a year, <laughs> and hopefully they'll one day find a cure for, for MD as well. Yeah, if, if we can prove it is a virus and it's an abnormal immune response to a virus, um, one of the think papers have suggested CMV, which is cytomegalic virus, so, so say people had many years due to CMV, we need a diagnostic test so we can diagnose them before the ear is damaged. So that's very important. And then if we were CMV, they need to find a vaccine for CMV for these particular people. So we need to know if it's a virus, what viruses are involved. And then if we know what virus is involved and we can spot it early enough, uh, can we um, provoke, produce a vaccine to prevent it um, happening? 
wonderful. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. And it's been, it's been a really great session and we still happily still have a few minutes left to go yes. through the additional questions. So, um, so this one is about treatment and it's to do with Zerk. I want to ask about the benefits of taking Zerk on a daily basis. I'm not taking only when I feel unwell or is it better to take a Zerk twice a day at eight or 16 milligrams? Yeah, that's a vasodilator called beta histine. It's a little bit expensive. Some it was based on the idea that the blood flow in the ear was very important. And if you had better blood flow through your ear, you could get rid of some of this fluid. So that was the idea. Um, the studies for circa are not terribly convincing. So a lot of us, myself included, um, don't use it as a frontline treatment at all now. Um, if you've been on CERC for a while and you decide, okay, I'll stop it, you have to stop it one tablet at a time. If you stop it suddenly, you can get a, a, an attack of vertigo. So the, there is something in it. It's the most commonly prescribed drug throughout the world. In places like Europe, they use enormous amounts of CERC. We tend to use 16 milligrams three times a day, um, but I still feel that the evidence is weak and that we're looking for other ways of treating many as other than CERC. It's quite expensive, makes a hole in your pocket having to buy it all the time. Yes, indeed. The next question about autoimmune theory um, you have covered as well as that of endolymphatic sac compression. Um, so the the question after that, I suffer with a 70% loss of function in my horizontal vestibular function on the left side. I've been reading up about neuroplasticity and I'm wondering if you know of anyone who's used this method successfully to improve dizziness. Yeah. It's the horizontal canal or lateral semicircular canal that, that does get affected first in many years. And this is the one uh, that works when you turn your head from side to side. So it's very commonly the first canal to be damaged. And you have, to, you have to be able to manage with your opposite ear to cope with the loss that's occurred. Um, that's why actually the caloric test is very good for spotting many ears, as opposed to some of the video head thrust tests. Um, the only way to overcome it, you're the pilot and you've got to pilot the plane with a deficient motor on one side so you have to be active, go on Nordic hiking trips with uh, Anne Elias, um, be, be active. The more you do, the, the better it is to overcome the deficit. Thank you, Professor. Um, the next question is sent to me privately. Um, it's to do with needing a review. Um, so I won't read that question out because um, I would encourage to ask the questioner to yeah, contact the clinic center directly on that one. Um, the following question is, my main issue is the fullness in the ears. I've tried diet and several drugs and they work up to 10 days and then stop working. What yeah. should I try for the oral fullness? That is really a hard one to, to treat. I used to try putting the grommet in the ear, but I'm not convinced it really works. Together with the Meniat device, which has been taken a bit off the market, I think, and a grommet, sometimes that can help. If you have any problem with the tube running from the nose to the ear, called the eustachian tube, that can certainly add to the problem. So if your fullness gets worse when you wake up in the morning, for instance, then it's likely that the tube became a bit more swollen overnight. And sometimes a, um, a medication to, um, like Dimitap or Dimitane can help. Um, but uh, it's quite hard to actually, I don't think I have a, a cure for that one, I'm afraid. It's, it's a nasty thing. It, fullness is a problem, yeah. Thank you. And, and please do jump in if we're running out of time. I will, I will try to get to maybe, maybe two more questions. Two more questions, sure. And, and then we must do the photo thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. we'll do the photo. I think many of the later ones will have been covered already, but um, I will read this from Daniela. I have, so this question asks, I have been newly diagnosed with MD and I have been managing the condition with a low sodium diet with rest 
effect. Recent testing of sodium level being very low, but balanced testing indicates a 50% loss. I mm -hmm. currently have no symptoms other than minor ear fullness. However, I'm finding I'm recently I'm overcome by nausea several times during the day, sometimes when screwing through the phone or sometimes just sitting and talking. Is this a result of the loss of balance function? Is it? Yes, yes. Mm. yeah, definitely. Yes, it's associative. Um, if, it, if we don't like people to take drugs such as Stemetil too often because it can cause a Parkinsonian type a problem. But if the nausea um, is only occurring intermittently, um, drugs such as Stemetil are helpful for the nausea. Um, you, you should talk to your own doctor because we don't want you, uh, them to get totally hooked on the stuff. Um, uh, so I hope the many air stays away. You're doing all the right things because they're avoiding salt, drinking lots of water. Valium is similar to um, Stemetil, by the way. It's a very similar drug. Uh, it's better for um, depression or anxiety than Stemetil, but it has the it comes from the same family. Um, so Valium or diazepam is quite a good vestibular sedative and can stop nausea as well. Great, thank you. And unfortunately, we're down to our final question. Thank you so much to everyone who's sent through those questions. Some of them are quite specific and perhaps should be asked in your next consultation. Um, the last question is, I think, one that many people have is, is flying out of the question for an MB patient? Not at all, but you mustn't get stressed and you mustn't fly when your uh, nose is blocked and you can't equalize the pressure in the air. But if you can do those, um, that's actually one of the times when if you are likely to get a bit stressed with flying, probably wear a small dose of Valium isn't such a bad idea, yeah. Right. And I think we will stop there, Professor okay. Gibson. Thank you so much for powering through this uh, hour long session. Oh, thank you, so it's like an excellent yeah. thank quiz you, master, Just fantastic. Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you. Brilliantly, Kaya. What we're going to do is everybody's going to put their video on so Professor can see who's attending this. And this is our way to thank Professor for doing this wonderful, wonderful webinar. So please put your videos on, everybody. I'd like to thank yeah, Jan Ran for also thank participating. You. And I would also like to thank um, Lynn for better hearing. Oh, look at everybody. Fantastic. They're all coming. Yeah. Hello. And we've got another thank page. You. Everyone, uh, come in. Turn oh, your well, thank you on. very much. Oh, no, you're welcome.